Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And before we read, I'm going to set you up. And uh, you're going to have to think about two different scenarios here. So Ephesians 1. And what I want you to think about, I'm going to give you two different people. And I want you to tell me, after I read you a little bit about each of the people, I want you to tell me who is more blessed. So consider, who is more blessed? Here's person number one. Homeless. This person's living quarters is made up of a thin blanket and pieces of a cardboard box. This person has only two changes of clothes that are rarely ever washed. And this person's food comes from the scraps found in the dumpsters of local restaurants. So that's person number one. Who is more blessed? Is it that person or person number two? This person will say it's a man whose earnings exceed $3 million per year. He lives in an elegant 3,000 square foot mansion with his wife and three children. He drives a brand new Tesla, of course, to work. And he also owns several other sports cars that he drives around for fun. Not only does he have a full-time maid, he also has a full-time chef, full chef who serves up a variety of different cuisines that are all tasty. So person number one or person number two, who is more blessed? Anybody want to answer? You say person number one, Miss Katie. Why would you say that? You gave, you gave the punchline way too early. <laughs> no, you didn't. You're okay. You're okay. Here's the answer. You're, you're way ahead of the message here, so kudos to Miss Katie. She gets a gold star. But the answer is, it depends. It depends. And I'll leave it at that, and we'll come back to that. So read with me Ephesians chapter 1, the first three verses. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, I want to point out a few things about these verses, and I'll come back and tell you about those two people and who's more blessed, and then we'll go on with the message here. So uh, just a few things to point out from what we read. Look at verse 1. Do you see? You've got to play along with me like we're, we're in class here tonight. Do you see two different groups of people in verse 1? Or do you only see one group of people in verse 1? Anybody got a guess? Is there one group or two groups? I have an answer of two over here. Anybody want to differ with Sherry? Got a two in the back? If you say one, that's okay. You got one back there? Okay. Well, let me, Hayden says two. All right. What's the one group? Miss Diana, you said the, there's one. What would you say is the one group? Okay. The faithful people in Christ. Uh, faithful in Christ Jesus. Anybody that said two want to tell me another group in that verse? Yeah, the saints. So it's really easy to read that verse and say, well, there's the saints at Ephesus, and they all must be faithful because all saints are faithful. Wrong or right? That's not true. You know that. I'm not faithful all the time. Neither are you. I, I can't say 100% of the time I'm faithful. I, I would love to say that, but that wouldn't be the truth. I point this out just to bring our attention to the fact that, and this is a, another study, but saints in your Bible are not named by any church after they die. You ever notice that? The churches that call people saints, it's not until after they're dead that they become saints. They have to have all these prerequisites. That's a bunch of baloney. A saint is anybody who knows Jesus Christ as Savior. So, we got St. Sherry right here. We got St. John. St. Don, St. Katie, St. Mark, St. Diana. Here we go over here, St. Phil, St. Pastor, or St. Michael. 
<laughs> St. Linda, St. Hayden, St. Cookie. You didn't know they had all these saints, did you? It sounds really silly to say it like that, doesn't it? And I don't think it's necessary to say that. I do think it's necessary because it's biblical to refer to saved people as what they are, saints. And notice the second part. Saints at Ephesus, the faithful, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So while God desires all people that are saved, all saints to be faithful to him, in reality, not all saints are always faithful to him. So here's the little 10 second message from verse one. If you're a saint, what does God expect you to do? Be faithful. First Corinthians four, it's required in stewards that they be found faithful. And if you go over there, that's actually faithful with God's mysteries, with things pertaining to the word of God. There's a whole list of things that you and I are to be faithful with, which would be another message. But don't just settle for being saved. Be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Has he been faithful to you? Okay. We're likely to be faithful to the people that are faithful to us. Right? You're likely to be less faithful to people who aren't faithful to you. You don't trust them. You can trust the Lord Jesus Christ above everybody else, can't you? He deserves my faithfulness. He deserves your faithfulness. Amen? Okay, there's that little uh, message on that first verse. Now look at verse 2. Oh boy, verse 2 is loaded. Key to getting verses 2 and 3 is actually the end of verse 1, the last three words. In Christ Jesus. So to be in Christ Jesus, I'm, I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ, what is he? A new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. So to be saved means to be in Christ. And if we have time here tonight, we'll look at some verses that kind of pertain to that. They, they go well with that end of that verse. But look at verse 2. If you are saved, if you are in Christ, there's two things in verse 2 that you have. What's the first word in verse 2, everybody? Grace. Grace. Have you received grace from God Almighty? You ought to be thankful for that. You don't get what you deserve as a sinner if you're saved. God's given you things you did not deserve. Well, I didn't deserve. I didn't earn them. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. If it was of ourselves, it wouldn't be God's grace. Okay. Then the next thing in verse 2 is what? Grace be to you and peace. You know what our world's looking for? I say all that about those kids up there and adults as well. What are they looking for when they're trying to get away from reality? What are they really in search of? Peace. That's what they want. They want to have a calm heart that is not fretting about all the things in the world. That's why they seek to detach from it. Because reality is difficult and hard and they want away from that. Now, I know part of the Christian life is going through hard things. I get that. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. At the same time, through those hard times, how have you endured? And everybody in here has been through them. How have you endured that? It's been by God giving you his peace, which passeth all understanding. People see you going through a hard time. They say, how are they doing that? And the answer to that is God's given me peace even through this difficult time. The world longs for that, don't they? Why do they not have it? Well, they're not in Christ Jesus. They need to get in Christ Jesus, but they're not in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad you got the answer? You got what everybody's looking for and it didn't cost you a dime, amen? People spend all kinds of money on trying to detach from reality to get peace that does not last very long. And it's not even real peace. Okay, verse three. Let's get into the nitty gritty here. Oh, but real quick, I gotta hit this in verse two. Did you notice in verse two, where does grace and peace come from? From God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word and separates God, our Father, from Jesus Christ, indicating there's God, the Father, and there's Jesus Christ, the Son. So there's two. Yes or no? But then the Lord Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. Are they two or are they one? I always love the answer Phil gives to these questions. Are they two or are they one, Phil? Yes. That's the right answer. Are they two? Yes. Are they one? Yes. Love that. Glad you're here to answer that question. Verse three. Now we'll get into this. I promise. Verse three, we'll get into the 
the heart of the message. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. Who hath, what's that next word? Blessed us. Blessed us with all, what kind of blessings? Spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Let's go back to where we started with person number one and person number two. You got the homeless fella, you got the millionaire. Who's more blessed? And I said, Katie got ahead of me, but if you really just answer it from knowing what you know, it depends. It appears that one man has much more blessing than the other. If you look at it, how? Materially, physically. One, well, let's be honest. The one guy has way more physically. But how about that homeless guy? If he knows Jesus Christ, you know what he has? He has a great deal more than that rich guy will ever have. So. The way our country's going, this might be all of us someday. You might lose your house. You might lose your car. I mean, you just can't pay for it, or maybe they take it away because everybody's got to have electric cars. We're all in trouble in here, I think, right? Don's got the hybrid. You got the hybrid, don't you? So half the time you're okay, and half the time you're not. Okay. I don't know what they do with that. But if they start, if that start happening, and we lose physical blessings, are we rich or are we poor? If you're saved, you haven't lost a thing spiritually. Now, I think that we'll all really get a dose of what, what's, what we're made of, what we really are made of if we were to lose some physical blessings. Don't you think? I mean, some of us, I'll put myself on this list, I'll just be honest. The Wi-Fi goes out. What do I do? <laughs> got to do my job, got to do my work. It's not the end of the world, but we, we fret over these little physical blessings that we ought not fret over. So here's the goal of tonight. We are going to take a look at, if we have time, seven, and we could go probably 20 of these or far more than that. We'll look at seven spiritual blessings. Here's the good part about this, these seven and any that we were to talk about moving forward from this. These are blessings that you can, no matter who's president, no matter what happens to the government or with our country, with any of that, these are blessings that you can never lose. If you know Jesus Christ, you will never lose any of these things. These blessings all pertain to save people. And I'm looking at people that I profess salvation in Jesus Christ. You can't lose these things. So before you are quick to complain about what you have lost, when it comes to physical things, make sure that you focus on what you do have spiritually. It's a good little thing right there. Focus on what you do have more than what you don't have. That'll save you a lot of grief, won't it? Focus on, how about this? Go a little further. Focus on what you do have that you can never lose, can never be taken from you. Focus on that far more than the things that you can lose. I mean, there's a whole lot that I could lose before I wake up in the morning. And when I wake up in the morning, all this stuff's gone, and I got, what do I do? The things we're looking at tonight, nobody can steal from you. The things we're looking at tonight, you will always have long after your body goes in the ground. You die and go in the ground. You'll still have. Them. So let's focus on these things. Have a good time with us tonight. Hopefully this will be uh, kind of fun for you and a good reminder of some things. So number one, let's turn over to Colossians chapter one. First thing, I'll give you seven if we got time. If not, then we'll, we may have to do a couple, three parts of this because there's a whole bunch of these spiritual blessings. Colossians chapter one. I'll read the verse and then I'll tell you the blessing. I've got probably two or three references to go with each of these. Most of these are in the New Testament. Actually, they might be all in the New Testament pertaining to, to save people in the church age. Colossians one, look at verse 14. Actually, back up to... Uh, Back up to 13, this is speaking of uh, the power of God and what he's done through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Notice the capital S. Son. In whom, that's in the son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, 
Even the forgiveness of sins. Here's blessing number one. Forgiveness of sins. Through and only through Jesus Christ. Let me be even more specific. If you have a King James Bible, let me be more specific. The forgiveness only comes through. What do you see in that verse? It starts with through. Through his blood. You want to watch the other translations. They just coincidentally, quotes, quote coincidentally, take out through his blood. If his blood is not there, you don't have redemption, you don't have forgiveness. Because without the shedding of blood in the Old Testament, there's no remission of sins. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there's no permanent forgiveness of sins. So that's pretty important that those three words be in that verse. Through his blood. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. So blessing number one, forgiveness of sins. Do you have that? That's a pretty awesome thing. Because a lot of people end up mentally insane. It's probably not politically correct, but they go crazy because they are carrying a load of sin. Let's be honest what it really is. They'll say it's baggage. They'll say it's my background and my upbringing. Truth be told, they're carrying around sin that they can't unload. And the reason why they can't unload it is because there's only one person that can unload it, and that's Jesus Christ. And here they are carrying that around. Without knowing Jesus Christ as Savior, they will always carry it around. That's why they'll never think straight. They'll never have the right mindset when, it's, when it comes to reality. So, number one, forgiveness of sins. Now, back up to Ephesians. Back up to Ephesians chapter 1. This is the same blessing here. We'll give you a couple verses on this. Ephesians 1, verse 7. God often puts similar verses in the Bible, and these two are not very far apart from one another. He puts them worded similarly on, similarly on purpose to get our attention so that we will compare Scripture to Scripture and gain some truth, gain some knowledge. Look at verse 7. Again, this is speaking of the work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom... We have redemption, notice the next three words, taken out of a lot of new translations, again, through his blood. Redemption through his blood, here it is again, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. How about the end of that verse? Riches. Who's the richest man in the universe? What's that? A saved man. Who's richer than a saved man, though, Brother Phil? Who's got the riches to give to the saved man? <laughs> It'd be the Lord Jesus Christ. So I know Elon Musk has been in the headlines. I know you got these billionaires that make their way into the headlines. They don't have anything in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. Far greater riches. And I love that, the way that's worded there. The riches of his grace. It'd be kind of neat if you had a fella that could give an unlimited um, number of people a million dollars. I'd get in line for that, wouldn't you? You can say yes. It's okay. I know you're in church, but you can say yes. Yeah, yeah. If somebody had the ability to do that, the line would never end. There'd always be somebody in line, wouldn't there? Because they would just wait and say, once I get up to the front, I'm getting my million dollars. And it would never run out. If you had somebody like that, it just never ran out. Well, you know there's nobody like that. But spiritually, spiritually, there is somebody like that. And he just keeps giving it out. And you don't have to wait in line for it either, do you? He just keeps dispensing. So if you checked his bank account, the grace available in the, the bank account of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't put a number on it. It's limitless. There, it doesn't ever run out. It just keeps going out and going out and going out. And it's available to anybody and everybody. I'm anti-Calvinist. It's for everybody and anybody. And uh, isn't that a great thing? Isn't that fun to think about? Your sin's forgiven. That's a great spiritual blessing. Would you agree with that? Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Okay, now this one... This one can be a little convicting, while at the same time being a verse to get really excited about. Verse 32, the last verse in the chapter. 432. And be ye kind one to another. 
I have to stop on this one um, just for a moment. Up at camp, one of the directors, his, his thing, um, he's always saying to the kids, and he actually has a shirt that says it, he wears from time to time. He says, be nice. If you all would just be nice, and he's referring to the kids, because they're not nice to each other. Be nice, be nice. Well, if you look at this verse, it says kind rather than nice. Similar idea, not exactly the same, but let's read the rest of the verse. And let's find out why people can't be nice. Verse 32, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And the world does not like doing that. But look at the rest of the verse. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven who? Uh, put your name there if that's you. You're more inclined to forgive people if you know all the sins that you committed that God forgave. The reason why people don't want to be nice to each other is because they don't have the kindness, the forgiveness, the forgiving heart that they need for others, toward others, that is only available through Jesus Christ. You don't get that through trying to be forgiving or trying to be kind and nice. You get that. It's a part of, really part of walking in the spirit is being forgiving because you've been forgiven. So uh, I go there to show you though, once again, your sins are forgiven. That's a great spiritual blessing. Your sins are only forgiven through Jesus Christ. It says for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So blessing number one, would you say that's worth getting excited about? forgiveness of sins that's a good one there's more this is like a, a, a goodie basket that you can just keep reaching in and get more and more and when you get a goodie out of a goodie basket especially if it's something to eat it sure does taste good give me some more sherry kind of did that for me uh when i got home with different desserts and uh this is kind of like going to the dessert bar and getting one after another spiritually just getting one thing after another. So there's number one. That's just one out of seven if we have time here. We'll get through three or four at least. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. I'll read the verse and I'll tell you the next one. 2 Corinthians 5. Blessing number two. Kind of goes hand in hand with blessing number one. 2 Corinthians 5, going on to verse 18. You see verse 17. There's our verse about a man being in Christ, being a new creature. And then verse 18. 518. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Notice that word that begins with an R that keeps showing up. You see it again in verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So here's blessing number two. It's just good Bible word, reconciliation. Reconciliation. So here's what that means. Before you knew Jesus Christ as your Savior, whether you were aware of it or not, you were an enemy of God Almighty. You were at odds with God Almighty. But now, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you are no longer an enemy. You are a child of God. So you went from enemy over here to child of God over here, and it all happened by the work of Jesus Christ being applied personally to you when you believed on him. So here you had these two that were at odds, have been brought together, and now they are reconciled. Now they are back in communion together. Wasn't that the way it, it was in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and chapter 3 until the serpent showed up, which was not very long? That's how it was. You had man and God together in union, in perfect harmony. Isn't that what you had? And the serpent comes along and obviously sin enters the world and everything got messed up. Jesus Christ went to the cross and became sin on the cross for us so that we might be brought back together in harmony and union with him. So that's reconciliation. Pretty neat. Good, good Bible word. Go, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We'll give you another verse on reconciliation. Romans chapter 5.
Look at verse 8. You probably know this verse. But God commended his love toward us in that while we, notice the tense, were. That's a saved person, past tense, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, I'm going to read verse 9 with the next uh, blessing, but go down to verse 10. For if when we, notice the past tense, were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So again, Jesus Christ made it possible for there to be perfect fellowship with God and man. And the work that he did through his death, burial, and resurrection is the work of reconciliation. So let me ask you, are you reconciled to God Almighty? Yeah. Isn't it better to be a child than to be an enemy? Wouldn't you rather be in the family than to be ostracized from the family? I hope that's you. Yeah. So, oh, by, by the way, how about verse 8? Isn't it better to be a saint than to be a sinner in God's eyes? Amen. That came about due to the work of reconciliation, which is only possible through Jesus Christ. So that's number two. Blessing number two, you have been reconciled. You've been forgiven, number one. You've been reconciled, number two. Look at number three. Look at verse nine for number three. Verse nine legal term here we're going to talk about you see in verse 9 much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him what legal term do you see there in that verse justified and the number number three blessing that we'll hit here is justification so what's that mean justified if, if uh, justification what's that all about when you believed on jesus christ you were in the sight of god you were declared to be righteous it doesn't matter what the world thinks of you if you're saved in the sight of god almighty you have his righteousness and therefore you are justified notice verse 9 what did it take for you to be justified? What do you see there? The blood of Jesus Christ. That blood keeps showing up. By the way, a little side note here. It's good that the blood runs through your Bible because the life of the flesh is in the blood. There's a direct correlation between life and blood flow. What do you have flowing through this book? you have the precious blood of Jesus Christ making this book alive. Amen to that? You know another book like that? Oh, there's not another one out there. This is the only one. You think about it. It's there in Genesis with uh, the, the Lord having to give Adam and Eve coats of skins. It's there. It's in Leviticus. Good night. It's all through Leviticus. Uh, all through the Old Testament with those offering of uh, sacrifices for sins. And then you get over to the New Testament, you got the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul, over and over, makes reference to it through his epistles. And you see that all the way through, uh, even the book of Revelation, it says they, uh, they gain victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even the book of Revelation. So all through there, Genesis, Revelation, you got that blood flow. And that's for the work of forgiveness, reconciliation, and justification. Uh, one more verse on justification. This really nails it down, makes it real clear. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 again. I know you're just there, but... There's a verse over there we left off on purpose so I could come back. 2 Corinthians 5, go to the last verse there in the, in the chapter, verse 21. What does it mean to be justified? Well, it means to be declared righteous in God's sight. Before I read the verse, I want you to think about it. Uh, Sherry and I, she probably more than me, but I like watching court cases. And for some reason, there's a fascination with all the proceedings in the court and truth tellers versus liars and judges that are really good at their job and some you kind of wonder about. And then lo defense lawyers who are as crooked as crooked as a snake. And then you got the lawyers that you really feel like they, they have a good heart and are trying to get the truth out. You wonder. But anyway, all that aside, if you were in the courtroom before Almighty God, 
And he played your life, and this would be any of us, my life, your life. He played the, the reel of your life. And all your sins obviously show up on that reel. Are you guilty or innocent before God? I don't know about you, but I'm in trouble. And I would be 100% deserving of the judge, the Lord Almighty, Lord God Almighty, slamming the gavel down and pronouncing me guilty. And then what happens after someone's declared guilty? What, are, what does the judge do? Maybe not immediately, but in time, what happens? They are sentenced. They're given their punishment. And the punishment would be everlasting fire, right? And that would be what I deserve. Well, there's somebody that shows up in the courtroom if you're saved. And over in 1 John, he's called your advocate. You know what an advocate is? He's defense, kind of like a defense lawyer. And he stands up and says, this person owes nothing because of me. I already made the payment for them. Their consequence, no, they don't, they don't get it. They might deserve it, but they don't get it. I already took care of it. It's on my account. Isn't that a great thing? That's called justification. You don't deserve it. It's all about what Jesus Christ did for you, but he had to pay the price on your behalf. So with that in mind, look at 2 Corinthians 5. Kind of get a, 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 just a good picture of how this looks here. Verse 21, for he, and that's God the Father in context, you can look at it. For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Let me stop right there. Are you a part of the us? I am. Hope you are too, Hayden. Yeah, amen. Got a lot of hands here. Look at the next part. Speaking of who Jesus Christ is, who knew no sin. Now, who's the sinner? Jesus Christ or me and you? We're the sinners, obviously. He knew no sin. But notice the first part of the verse. God made Jesus Christ to be what? Sin in our place for us on our behalf. Look at the last part of the verse. Here's where the justification comes in. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's in Jesus Christ. Notice the word made. First part of the verse. Made him to be sin. End of the verse. Be made the righteousness of God. Now hold on a second. I have a hard time with this. I, I'm being facetious here, but let me just play the, play the role here. The sinner is me. The righteous is Jesus Christ. But what does the verse say, folks? If you're saved, who's the righteous one? You are. And who became sin for you? Jesus Christ. The only way this is possible is for him to live the life that none of us could ever live. The sinless life which he did live, which made him qualified to become the greatest, most perfect sacrifice for sins that could never be topped. So he offered himself, his blood was shed, as Hebrew says, once for all, no more sacrifices, amen? He paid it so that you and I could be justified. So next time somebody asks you, are you a good person? What's your answer to that? Oh, contraire. You can say you are a good person, but you better preface that. What should you say? I have no righteousness of my own. I have no goodness of my own. But God has given me his righteousness because I believed on Jesus Christ. Oh, and you can have the same thing if you would like. Somebody asked you that's not saved. So, kind of a trick question there. All right, so we got three of them down. We've got forgiveness of sins. We've got reconciliation. We've got justification. Let's see if we can get through. We'll get through one more of these, and I'll save. We've got a, a list that we can add to this, so we'll we save it for next week. Is that okay? Do a couple of these? Okay, so uh, let's go number four. Uh, John chapter three. This is a fun one. I have to end on this one because this is a fun one. They're all fun, but man, this one, I tell you, is a, it, it's literally mind-blowing to try and think about this. And this is how spiritual blessings are. You really can't completely wrap your mind around it because it's spiritual. It's, as I'm going to tell you here, this one is eternal, which all these are, but this one specifically is called eternal. And your head will explode if you try to think about this, but it's a reality if you're saved. John 3, look at verse 15. John 3, 15. 
Actually, go to 14. We'll go to 14 and read down through 16. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Blessing, spiritual blessing, number four, eternal life. Go down to verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen to that, Hayden. Go down to the end of the chapter. Look at the last verse, 36, 336. We often read verse 16. 36 is a really good one, too. 336. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. A great spiritual blessing. If you're saved, you have eternal life. Now, even as a kid, before I knew anything doctrinally about this, and I could point to the verses, I used to wonder, how could it be that people believe you can lose eternal life when it's eternal life? And I had a fella in college, actually, it was, uh, got a, there's a group of people that, that took me to a church of God, charismatic type church when I was in college. And that pastor at that church had me thinking I could lose my salvation. So I had to call up my dad and say, Dad, what, what do I do about this guy? And of course, what do you think they were doing? They were taking verses out of context in order to try to prove that. And my dad had to get me in the, get me in the Bible and get me straightened out on that, show me the verses that were in context that say, eternal life and you can't lose it and i think that's a pretty good argument right there if it's eternal life when do you lose it you don't lose it or else god did not give you eternal life he didn't tell you the truth is it eternal life or not well i believe what god said god said eternal life that means you can't have it taken away God's not an Indian giver where he gives and takes it away. Oh, here's eternal life. No, you don't have eternal life. Here it is back. That's not the way it is. I'm glad for that too. And by the way, you don't keep yourself saved, do you? And we'll hit that one next week with one of the spiritual blessings. But eternal life is something that God's given you that he will not take away. Again, only coming through Jesus Christ. Go to Romans 6. Romans 6. Two more verses on this. We'll wrap up. Romans chapter 6. You know this verse. But let's look at the portion that applies to this spiritual blessing. Romans 6, look at the last verse in the chapter, verse 23. You get the bad news first, then you get the really, really good news second in this verse. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. How do you get it? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I read that verse, I mean, many, many times, and it was not that long ago, probably within the last year, I underlined in my Bible, got my the, the Lord got my attention when I read the verse, I underlined the wages, and I also underlined the gift, and those are contrasting terms. Wages are something you earn. So what do you earn being a sinner? Death. I would much rather take the gift, the gift you don't earn or else it's not a gift. The gift is given to you. But remember something about gifts. Somebody had to pay for it. You just didn't pay for it if you're the recipient, but somebody paid for it. And Jesus Christ through his blood paid for it. So notice it says the wages, but then it says the gift. Hey, if you got a choice, what are you taking? You taking those wages or are you taking that gift? Isn't the gift way better? Okay, I'll put it another way. You taking death or you taking eternal life? I'll take eternal life over death any day of the week. So spiritual blessing number four is eternal life. And again, if you've noticed these verses, practically every verse has pointed to one person being responsible for it. reconciliation, justification, forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And who's that person? Not you. Nobody in here. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't he deserve the glory? Look at all he did for you and me. How about one more? Go to 1 John. 1 John. Good verses to take somebody when you're witnessing, but good verses even when we're in church to look at and get excited about. 1 John 5.
Look for the words eternal life. You'll see them a few times here, a couple times at least. Look at verse 11, 1 John 5, 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Where do you get that? And this life is in his, capital S, in his son. Watch verse 12. I love verse 12. All words in verse 12 are one syllable. Don't tell me you can't understand the Bible. The whole verse, every word is one syllable. Isn't this neat? Watch this verse. He that hath the son hath life. Pretty simple. You have the son, you got life. Contrast. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. I would guess an ESV or an NIV, you don't have the simplicity that you got in your King James Bible right there. Hadn't looked at those recently, but that'd be my guess, knowing how those, those verses usually go. But isn't that simple? I see two clear, distinct groups of people in that verse. You either have the Son, you have life. You don't have the Son of God, you don't have life. Simple as that. Now look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have what? eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the son of God. Notice two times in that verse, believe on the name of the son of God. Those words believe on the name of the son of God. And if you've done that, what do you have? You have eternal life. Isn't that a great spiritual blessing? Let me close and ask you a question. Are you blessed? Amen. You're blessed. If you're saved, you are blessed. And once again, you might want to brace yourself. The end of 2021, 20, or, uh, 21. The end of 2022, where am I living? The end of 2022 and 2023 and beyond, it might, it's probably going to get a little tough for us. Remember to count your spiritual blessings. You know the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Well, you may have to just not be able to count your physical blessings, and that should be okay. Because you've got an abundance of spiritual blessings being saved. Amen? All right, we'll continue. I got, had three more for tonight. We'll add those to next week and probably add a few more. And uh, we'll just see, see how long this takes us here. But thank God for spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your words. They are certainly encouraging. I know I certainly needed to see these things tonight and not get uh, all bogged down with the, the darkness and the nonsense that this world sends our way. I pray for our local church here, all this body of believers Folks that are here as well as folks that are, that are not that would normally be and, and can't be for some other reason. Lord, I pray you strengthen us, empower us to live for you and focus. Give us all a focus on the spiritual blessings rather than all the physical blessings that could be gone in an instant. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that we do have both. But we uh, thank you that we have spiritual blessings that we can never, ever lose. And we just give you the praise and the glory for that. May we, may we go out of here just rejoicing in those things tonight. And remind us of those things, these things in the days ahead, uh, whenever things come our way that are difficult. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.